So just welcoming uh, Dr. Prasad. Uh, he's a senior economist at the International Labor Organization's Research Department in Geneva. And I think you gave a much better introduction than I will give you about your presentation. Um, so I will let you start, actually. Thank you, Arina. I think we have a challenge to keep you awake. Huh? <laughs> Without the coffee, not sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you, Petra. Thank you, the organizers, for inviting me. Uh, you know, I come from a small island state, uh, Fiji, and I live in a small state. I'm a migrant. Uh, I, I, I live and work in, in, in Switzerland, in Geneva. And uh, this morning, I came from a small state. I had a seven-hour flight, and I landed at about 7 a.m. I came from Qatar. So all small states, huh? Uh, and, and as I didn't mention, I'm an economist. I, I work on labor issues, employment issues. And I'm also the, the chief of training uh, for our department in terms of what we do, uh, train officials, uh, policy makers, on how to use evidence to influence policy. What is evidence and what is policy? How to assess evidence? That's what we do to promote decent work. And, and uh, the, the, the legal component, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I got interested in that. Uh, from, uh, whatever touches the issue on the world of work, employment. So all the legal issues we have to understand if we want to really analyze and do research on, on labor market issues. It comes together. One side is economics, of course, labor market. And the other side is the legal. So that's why I got interested. I mean, I was just following this, morning, this morning's session, and especially this uh, just before us, and we had fantastic presentations, uh, statements. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I wrote a paper in 2008 about uh, smart, small but smart, uh, basically the diplomacies of small states. And in that, I had quoted, you know, uh, a certain Williams, Shenstone, a British poet in the 17th century, what he said about law, what we are talking this, this, this afternoon, was he said, laws are generally found to be nets of such texture as the little one creep through, the great break through, and the middle sized are alone entangled in it. So in fact, I did a lot of research on understanding how small states navigated their way into the international system. And I, I thought they were very smart in how unconventional they were, how unorthodox they were, in order to find ways to develop their countries. So it was using the uh, sovereignty, what we call that now, I mean, my friend from Malta, Godfrey Baldecchino, calls uh, uh, jurisdictional resourcefulness, how you can st use the state apparatus, uh, your ministries of foreign affairs, your economic ex exclusive zones, your dot TV, TV to value, how you could use this state apparatus to sell abroad yourself, right? And, and how you would sell your votes in the UN system, right? So they are very smart and they are still very smart, right? Uh, but today I will be talking about, uh, uh, I, had, I, I have a paper, in fact, which I'm writing. Petra had encouraged me to write on the international labor standards and the small states. And uh, international labor standards, we are talking this afternoon about the conventions. Uh, you know, uh, Alison was talking about how to domesticate international conventions. I think most of you are here from the legal background, no? so you understand conventions and recommendations and protocols, uh, declarations. Uh, as I was mentioning, ILO is a normative uh, UN agency. It was created in 1919, one of the oldest agency, the second oldest agency of the United Nations. The first one was in 1873, I think we were talking about the, the Postal Union uh, and ILO in 1919. It was created in the uh, 
uh, peace treaty when the World War I ended, uh, the Versailles Treaty. Uh, anybody wonder why an uh, organization of labor would be created in a peace treaty? Lovely. Yeah. Many people died in the war, but what is it related to labor then? Restructuring. Hmm? Restructuring. Restructuring. Shortage of labor. Yeah, you're touching there. Yes. Harmonization. Harmonization. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, uh, I'll just simplify. I mean, ILO was created for three reasons. Huh? And in the peace treaty, I'll come back to that. So the first one was we were in 1919. So two years before something very major happened, Russian, Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the workers took power, basically. And all the leaders at that time were really scared that the workers are ag very agitated and they may take the power. So something had to be done to channel their frustration. So let's buy in the workers, right? So in the, in the first article on the, the, in, in the preamble of uh, ILO's constitution, it's written, if you want peace, cultivate social justice. Peace and social mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. Right? Beautiful. So the second reason exactly what we are talking about is there was this issue about exploitation of workers. Uh, women were working, ch children were working, they were like uh, 18 hours a day, miserable conditions. So more for humanitarian reason, right? And the third reason was economic. And this is something that uh, not many people know, why ILO was created for economic reasons. Anybody want to give a try? Just so that you don't sleep, I'm encouraging you to participate. <laughs> why economic reason? All right. Huh? Rebuilding. Rebuilding, absolutely, yeah, rebuilding. But think of WTO we are talking about. It's exactly the same arguments as WTO in 1919. We have not gone far huh, after 100 years. <laughs> so, in fact, the, the, the drafters of ILO, the, those who were basically the, those who had the idea with the British. <laughs> yeah. they, they basically, I mean, because they wanted to buy off the labor because they had contributed a lot during the war, you mentioned. So they wanted to have them on, on, on their side, British government, right, at that time. So they wanted to create that agency. Uh, the, the economic reason is that, that Britain knew that they will be developing reconstruction and everything, right? And therefore, there will be social progress, right? They will be giving rights to workers. Basically, the idea was to appease the workers because they had contributed a lot to the, to the war. So they wanted to give their rights, workers' rights, right? So they, uh, the, the British also wanted <coughs> that other countries do the same. Because if not, it will be unfair competition. Won't it be? If, for example, Brit British, uh, in, 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 in England, we, we say, OK, the workers' right is eight hours a day, no more. And the and, and, and US say, OK, you can work like 15 hours a day. So, race to the bottom, right? So that's why I said, if a country wants to progress socially, other countries should not be an obstacle to its progress. That's written in the Constitution of ILO. So these are the three reasons why uh, ILO was created in 1919, uh, basically to promote social justice. Mandate, we're talking about mandate, it's very clear. In our mandate is very clear. And in 1969, 50 years after, ILO won the Nobel Peace Prize. 1969, 50 years after creation, right? And uh, we had some money, and I'm using that money now. I'll come back to that, because we had put that Nobel Peace Prize money, one million Norwegian money, whatever it was called, it was in a trust fund. And we inherited that, and I used that money to train policymakers. It's still there. It's, it's like a trust fund. So Nobel Peace Prize helping us train policymakers. So we are part of that system. Uh, and, and, and I mentioned ILO is a standard setting 
agency where we produce conventions, recommendations, declarations, and protocols, right? And in that, and, uh, let me come back again to that when, when the, the drafters basically created ILO, they said, okay, it, it won't be only a government controlled agency. Because at the time there was none. I mean, what, what agency cre was created in 1919? Another one. No, international. Uh, 1919. 1919, the same time as I. The League of Nations. Right, the League of Nations, right? It died after the Second World War, it didn't survive. That's how the UN was created in 1945, right? Uh, so, so when they were creating this ILO, the British said, we want the workers to be sitting on the table and the employers, because they are the ones who create jobs and basically monitor what's happening on the labor market. It's not, I mean, governments don't create jobs. Do you agree with me? Except in the public sector, huh? which is minimal, huh? and they're reducing that. So 100 years ago, they were saying that the private sector will create jobs, mm -hmm. right? Not the public sector. So they brought the workers and employers on the same table as the government to, to make decisions, basically, to make conventions. When, 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 when Nicole was talking about ILO being the most efficient, Indeed, because we brought the workers, employers, and the government together to solve the problem. If you bring the workers, the employers, and government, you bring the whole society, right? Whatever you call it, UN calls it civil society, right? And in 1990, it was already created, that system. And it has been operating very, very well since then. All the conventions, all the recommendations, all the declarations are negotiated by the government, workers, and employers. And that's the beauty. It takes time, but when the convention comes out, uh, anybody guess how many conventions are there, ILO's convention? How many of them since 100 years, how many conventions have we come out? <coughs> the last one was just in June this year. 328. <laughs> 328, huh? <laughs> In, in between, maybe the, the, do an average. 190, 190, yeah, 190 uh, convention. The first convention, what, what would, would be the first convention in 1919? What was the major issue? Partnership working. Hmm? Partnership, Partnership working. working. Mm -hmm. Working is there, yeah, but there's another word missing. Help. Help. The first convention, what you call C1, working time, number one. You talked about a little bit partnership, yeah. Working time, C1 is working time, right? Uh, eight hours a day or 48 hours a week. That's, that's when they decided. And, and at the first sitting in Washington in 1919, the, the workers, employees, and government adopted six conventions on one city. Amazing, huh? <laughs> and we have been producing ever <laughs> since then. But the problem with this production is that then you have to monitor them. Huh? Yeah. You have to implement them. You have to domesticate them. Mm. But, but ILO, I mean, I, you know, ILO is composed of three things. One is the International Labor Organization, which I mentioned is workers, employees, and government. <laughs> where every year they come and meet what we call the International Labour Conference. In Geneva, they meet, right? And in between, there is the governing body of ILO, which they meet every six months, and there are 58 members. And then there is the secretariat, like people like me, who help basically what has been decided by you, your governments, your, your workers and your employers. Right? So there are three components. So when you come to Geneva, those who have come to Geneva ILO office, Anybody? What it's written when you come right at the outside? Remember. Can't remember. <laughs> it's not written I International Labour Organization. It's written, yeah. It's the International Labour Office. Fantastic. Right. You can have a coffee now. 
<laughs> it's International Labour Office. That's where you come, right? Okay, let, let's come to the topic. I mean, if no, I can talk about ILO, you know, till, till three o'clock and Irene will be very unhappy with me. <laughs> yeah? So, in fact, I wanted to uh, talk to you about... Let me come a little bit this side so that I can see. Uh, about... Yeah, microphone, yeah. Okay. About small states and international labor standards. As I said, we have 190 conventions. I wanted to first tell you about the theory of small states. I think you know most of them. You had already mentioned some of them. We'll refresh our memory about them. And why do countries ratify? Why do countries ratify conventions? Have you asked that question? Because these are not... Oh, we lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that I can see it from you. Yeah, yeah, it's working, eh? Okay, right. So, because when there's a convention done by ILO, countries have to ratify. It's not nothing to do with peace and security in terms of fact, huh? It's not those treaties, the nine treaties we are talking about, or any, anything about conflicts. These are con human rights conventions, which is linked to the domestic issues. So why would countries ratify conventions? We'll come back to that. And ILO has eight fundamental conventions. We say eight fundamental conventions because if you have not ratified those eight, you can't do much, you can't progress. And you guess what are those eight? Maybe we'll come back later. And then uh, uh, one of my colleagues, David Kuchera and Sari, recently published a paper in, in the International Labor Review, which started in 1921, that review. Uh, and they created an index on violation of labor rights. Violation, they, they have 108 indicators to, to, I mean, they have codified legislation, international legislation, and, and said which countries are the most violators of those labor standards, right? And I look into the small states. I'm interested to look at from the small states perspective, right? And, and how does the small state fare with the supervisory mechanism of ILO? When a country ratifies a convention, three things happen. Number one is what? When your country, uh, St. Lucia, ratifies the Convention on Child Labor, no children under 14 should walk, right? Of course. What's the first thing it will do? Of course, it will sign, yes? Legislate domestic Right, domesticate. So, first is sign. So, first thing is domestication. Right? In other words, you translate those international principles, say 14 years, into your domestic laws. And it has to go to the parliament. Parliament has to approve it, become national laws, right? Second thing it does is. Okay. It start at commencement time, it just starts. Right. So, yeah. Se second thing it does is. It tells them when to start. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. good point, good point, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the second thing is it allows ILO's supervisory mechanism to come in more detail. Okay. So it becomes open to monitoring. You, you lose your sovereignty, in other words, you, you open yourself. So that ILO experts come and monitor you. So that you are doing what you have promised. <coughs> How would uh, the experts know what you are doing, what, what you have signed is what you are doing? The third thing is you are obliged to send reports every five years on the particular convention, every five years. And that's why we're talking about capacities of small states, not great. And, 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 the, and, and in our reports we see that most of the small states are lagging behind their reporting duties. Two cycles, like ten years late. Yeah, 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 big, big, big. So, so, so especially small states. They don't have the capacity. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm from Fiji. I mean, my neighbors, Kiribati, Tuvalu. There's one person. Mm -hmm. right? We're talking about Antigua and the lawyer. Right? Mm -hmm. If the lawyer goes, nothing happens. It's the same thing if, if the person is traveling, where, goes to Australia for a conference, nothing happens in Tuvalu. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's why they are quite late. So uh, we will look into the supervisory mechanism. Right? So these are the three things I would like to look. We'll see up to where we can go. I have lots of graphs and data to show, but three o'clock, I think we don't work, so we'll talk, right? Let's just touch on the theory a little bit, right? 
little bit background. We have we, we know. I mean, uh, uh, Alison was talking about being small. You are vulnerable, right? Uh, and it comes with all these challenges. You know, we were talking about hurricanes. I mean, Fiji gets also three hurricanes a year. We uh, Bahamas, our sister and brothers from Baha Bahamas, they are suffering now. So there is a concept of re resilience. We are very resilient, right? So. And then the small states have to cope up with these, these, these uh, vulnerabilities. Despite being vulnerable, they overcome those challenges. So we, we see the, the glass half full now, huh? right? And there were many theories from the 1960s and 70s that we, I'll come back to that. In fact, the, the organization that started really looking into the small states issues is what organization? Not I alone this time. Commonwealth Secretariat, right? Because most of its members are small states, small island states. So they started, they did a lot of reports in the 60s and 70s and 80s. There was a fantastic report in 1985, uh, overcoming the vulnerability basically, right? So, and there was this theory about that, right? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the first, I mean, there was this resistance to this neoliberal agenda, like we are different. You know, we're talking about WTO this morning, huh? We are different, give us, exceptions, give us derogations. We know when Malta tried to negotiate in succession to the EU, how many derogations it got? 72. Never ever happened to a EU state in the session. Malta said, oh look, I'm small, I'm vulnerable. I mean no harm. So Europeans can go and settle there, unlike other, uh, other countries. I mean many other exceptions it managed to get. Right? So they tried to resist all this global phenomenon. Right? They said, these uh, uh, neoliberal ideologies doesn't suit them. And then they tried to get this special and different treatment with WTO. Succeeded a little bit, no, still discussions going on. And now, in fact, uh, our countries from the Pacific are champions of climate change. My prime minister is going all around the world, uh, championing for the cause of climate change, right? Uh, I, I come from a farm, I have a personal story too, you know, I, uh, I grew up on a farm in Fiji, small farm. Uh, whenever I go back, the sea is coming in our farm. So the, the rice production is going down, and it's subsistence. Uh, but it's not great, uh, it's, it's a personal story. Uh, so, so climate change is real, I mean, uh, hmm. wake up everybody, <laughs> it's real. So our Prime Minister, and especially the Prime Minister of Kiribati, the very eloquent, Anote huh? Tong. I think he he's no longer in power, but he was fantastic. He went around the globe bringing you know an issue about Kiribati. And and some of the theories about about small states in the international relations, you know, you band work and you go with them. Uh, you have to be neutral. You integrate. And the others say you have to be real, small small states can't survive. I mean, in the 1960s, we were 70s, we were talking about you know, that period of decolonization. There were so many small states be becoming independent. Mm -hmm. And some were saying, oh, these guys are not viable. They can't be states, right? Uh, realism, right? Others are what we're talking about, status seeking. Like, although we are small, but we'll show you what we, what, what we can do. Like we're talking about uh, Antigua case, right? And also uh, Trinidad's case on the ICG, right? Small states, Singapore, right? Qatar is doing a lot these days, but with money, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so they want to get attention, they, although they're small, but they, 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 they can do many things. And of course, the shelter theory also, there's, a, there's an element of shelter theory. I'll come back to that. Okay, how do small states behave in relation to the core labor standard? That's what I want to ask. And in fact, I took a, a definition of less than 3 million people. I consider them small states. It's very arbitrary. Uh, when I was doing my research, I took 1.5 million, like the Commonwealth Secretary does. And here I just increased it. And then, then I come back to my definition of 1.5, and I look into the islands. You will see the difference, right? Okay, uh, so why do countries uh, ratify? conventions. One is for reciprocity. If I will ratify, for example, uh, uh, if America has ratified, so Fiji will be more or less obliged to ratify because 
Fiji is a strong trading partner with US, suppose, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a question of reciprocity. Also, when there is this element of domestic politics, when I said when there is this momentum inbuilt that certain things about child labor I was talking about, you're giving freedom of association. Uh, maybe the labor governments are in power, right? Right? And there is this feeling that they are more progressive. So that's when things can happen, that's when they can ratify convention. Uh, also, they want to show that they are part of the bigger club, right? They are part of the bigger club. Because other countries have ratified, similar countries, like the peers, they will also want to ratify. If Mauritius has ratified, Fiji will do that. <laughs> right? Sure, for sure. And we are always posing the question, how come Mauritius is developing better than us? It's tiny. It's like uh, 15 times smaller than the Fiji. It is bigger, huh? Oh, bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this rivalry with the Fijians and the Mauritians, huh? So if Mauritius had ratified, we will try to ratify too. Uh, Yes, but also if, for example, if America is considering ratifying the minimum age convention, which it has not, or it has ratified with Obama, yeah? maybe it has not ratified the, the freedom of association. If China somehow has ratified Russia, America will be obliged to do that, right? Uh, because it becomes a benchmark, like same kind of countries, right? Or, as I said, you want to belong to a, a normative community, a community of states. You want to be part of the big plan. So these are some of the reasons, very briefly I'm going up, why countries ratify ILO conventions. Any questions so far? All right. There are two theories. Huh? First theory is that uh, we want to reduce basically the risk of suffering competitive disadvantage, right? It's what I was talking about, the economic reasons. We will ratify for economic reasons, right? The other theory is what we call the sociological institutionalism. It's where we call for confirming particular norms. So I try to test these two theories in our international labor standards indicators, right? And we found, and other papers have also found, that in fact, it's the second which dominates. It's not the first. I was surprised. Uh, this, this, this paper by Bacini and Queen in 2011, they also found exactly the same thing. That in fact, it's more the, the institutionalism sort of uh, which, which, uh, which uh, is, well, they do regressions, I mean, economic, econometric, econometric analysis, huh? and they, they found uh, that it's the second one, uh, which, uh, which the sociological institution, which is, uh, which is much stronger than the first one, right? For small states. Huh? And also, the, 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 the population is an indicator negative. In other words, the bigger you are, the less you ratify. Okay? The bigger you are, the less you ratify. Smaller ones ratifying. Strange, huh? And we'll explain that thing, all right? Uh, so, stronger performance by small states. That's also we we find your results. I have this paper, which if those who are interested in academics, I can share with you, right? Uh, and of course, small states typically rely on cooperation and alignment with the larger states. I mentioned that, right? Uh, yeah. So the eight conventions that I have looked into, the fundamental conventions, are these eight conventions. One, the first, I mean, there are four them thematic areas. The first thematic area is the freedom of association and, and collective bargaining. There are two conventions, what we call the C87 and C98, you can see. Elimination of all forms of forced or compulsory labor, right? There are two conventions of, of 1930 and 1957, 105 and C29, and effective abolition of child labor. Right? If you have child labor in your country, you can't progress in China. Those, those are fundamental. So there are two conventions, 138 and 182, and discrimination, right? Uh, C1, no, it's not 1,000, there's one extra. I was generous, I think, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I was very generous there, huh? It's C100, right? And C111. Uh, and as of January, there are about 1,376 ratifications. Imagine the amount of report we get. So 190 conventions, 
times 187 member states. How many reports will it get? It's massive. It's massive. And the report, when the report is given to us, it's not just the government is saying everything's fine. Right? The reports has to come compulsory with the, uh, the comments of the unions and the employers. It's compulsory. So if this government sends and signs and give it to us, that's not considered a purchase. We don't look into that. Right? So it's really what's happening on the ground. It's most fact. Right? We don't even go to the field to check what's happening because the workers and the employers tell us uh, in their reports. And that's how it's validated. And then there is this committee of experts. There are 20 committee of experts, uh, independent judges and very senior magistrate who have been nominate, nominated for five years. And they look into these reports and they look into the national legislation in law and what's being practiced. And so law and practice, both things, right? Not only this legislation, but we, we ask them for data, evidence, if there was anybody persecuted, how many children are in school, and all. So we get data to know what's happening in reality. It's not only just that, oh, the parliament has passed this law, we are, we are off the hook. And then we ask the following questions that they have to give. Right? All right, so I just looked into how many countries have ratified all the eight conventions, right? And I tried to make a distinction between, you know, the blue is uh, all other countries, like 80% have ratified, 20% of small states have not ratified. So if you can see the other graph, uh, 77 uh, uh, convention, uh, 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 all the, all the non-small states have ratified compared to 23% of small states, right? There's not much big difference whether you are a big state or a small state here, yeah, right, for the fundamental convention. However, the, the things change when you are a small island country. Island, ratify more. Why? Big fish. Big fish? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's question of social cohesiveness mm -hmm. also, which plays in proximity, uh, vulnerability maybe, yes, so ratify more. So these are some data, and again, I looked into uh, which similar trends of running between the two regions. I know these are some numbers, I don't want to bore with you, I don't want to go into the detail, economists talk about numbers. Uh, <laughs> what I will show you is when, when David Kuchera uh, and Sari they did the, the index, they look into the five big uh, categories, fundamental civil liberties, the right of workers to establish and join unions or other union activities, right to collective bargaining and right to sector, the five categories that they use, and there are 108 indicators. And after that, what they did was this thing. In terms of the violations, so there's a score here, I'll explain to you, between zero and 10, right? So the overall score, for example, for, for the rest of the world, non, being non-small state, is four out of 10 in terms of violation. You are average, right? Smaller states are better. So they are doing better in terms of they are not violating labor rights, right? That's overall, you can see in law and in practice, <coughs> similar story, even in practice is even lower. The score is lower. So if you have a score low, like close to zero, that means you are doing great. Right. If you have 10, it's horrible. So this is just the efforts, right? So small states are doing better in not violating labor rights. Yes? Do other countries have to report to you like small states do? All countries. Mm -hmm. I'm right, I thought that might no, 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 be no. the reason why they all the countries have to report. No, all countries. I mean, all the 187 countries report. No. It's an obligation. If you have ratified conventions, yeah. you have to report. Yeah, yeah you following? Mm -hmm. So small states are doing better. That's a good point, huh? That's already our finding. Oh, we economics, we, you know? Uh, if there's something good we can add that. The glass yes, is half. I was just saying that to her. We got that. You yeah. Know, yeah. But you know, it, it can be obvious, but here's the data we show. You know, in order to influence policy, we use data. There you go. Bingo, right? No. <coughs> Another slide. Yeah. Okay. 
I have lots of things. I don't want to go into all these details, right? One thing I don't want to show you. Uh, I'll explain to you some economic graphs, right? <laughs> you know, there's this score about uh, how democratic your country is, right? And, and one American institute does what you call the polity scores, right? Uh, the higher you are, the better you are, right? The score is 1 to 0, right? No, it's minus 10 to 0. Yeah, or minus 10 to 10, sorry, right? And we took the, the number of violations on your x axis, right? Uh, <coughs> You can see, for example, Fiji, my favorite country, uh, democratically it's not great. It's around zero, right? It should be 10, right? And it's also uh, 30 violations in 2016. Not great, right? And of course, the biggest violators are those three countries there. So you can see a general trend as your democratic system is not great, you tend to violate more. Which is common sense, no? Right? But here's the numbers. You can show, I mean, if you want to argue this point, here are the numbers. And the same thing I did, I took this World Bank's, what we call the Voice and Accountability Index, and I compared it with the Kuchara in, 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 um, Index, the same thing, right? Here I put all the countries together, all. And the red ones are the small states. Similar story matches. Similar. So the countries, that are more democratic, better governance system, tend to respect labor rights better. Common sense again, huh? but I'm showing it with numbers. And you can see the culprits, which are the higher level there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's Djibouti, Cuba, and others, and Swaziland, Bahrain, uh, yeah, Gambia. And this side is, of course, better. Mauritius and others are, are the other side. So, good story. I'm done. I have just two, yeah. two, three things to show. One is there's a minor difference between small states and non-small states in the ILS at the beginning of the fundamental conventions. However, in terms of the index we mentioned, small states are doing better. Right? So, balance, right? And if you are a small island country, you are even doing better. Right? So, it's better to be an island or the Rather, the, the not to be an island, right? <laughs> yeah, island, you have, you know, yeah. ocean, economic exclusive zone, and so, so yeah, it's much better. I think that that's it. Uh, yeah, we yeah? can take yeah? some questions. We'll now. take some questions. Yes, Nicole. Would the performance of small island developing states, um, uh, the good performance in relation to the data that you have, have any correlation to the uh, presence and the proactive um, uh, activity of unions uh, on the islands. But I, I can speak for Jamaica, we're very, very active in relation to uh, unions, workers unions. Yeah. And we have been for, uh, uh, since before independence. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there are two points. Thanks for that. We have seen that in the Caribbean islands, they are the least violators. I have regional breakdowns too, huh? and it's one of the best regions. Not the Latin Americans, they are the worst. But the Caribbean islands are the best. I mean, this also relates to some historical uh, notions of your trade union leaders in the 50s and 60s who fought for your independence became in power. I mean, you have your Owens and uh, uh, yeah, Badly. Badly and yeah, and the other one in Mauritius was Ram Gulam and, and the others, you know. Uh, so these are very visionary leaders, uh, leftist trade union movement. And they continued. I mean, Barbados, both are Labour parties, no? There are two parties which alternate. And both are Labour, new or old, whatever they call it, huh? But both Labour. So there's uh, some historical notions that the trade union movement has, has been strong. And in Jamaica too, very, very strong. Uh, not so much in Fiji. Uh, and also, during a few years, I mean, there were some issues with trade union movement in Fiji. Mauritius is doing great, but there have been lots of complaints about Mauritius uh, on not respecting the trade union rights. There have been some complaints. Yes. Uh, <coughs> yeah. No, I'd, I'd be interested to know to what extent the UK's uh, reporting obligations has 
are, are there separate reports for the UK's and French and other countries that have overseas territories? And how, how do the UK overseas territories come out in the reports? Yeah, good question. Uh, in fact, it's just in the annex when they send the reports. The, for example, the French, they include the Reunion, Martinique, and Haiti, and others, you know? It kind of becomes blurred within their national report. There's some anecdotes here and there. It doesn't come out very nicely. But, but in, in generally, they're doing pretty good. Uh, not only in terms of the rights, because France and, and, and UK were the main creators of ILO. US, although it was part of Wilson, was part of that, but they didn't join ILOs till 1934 because the Senate uh, didn't want it to join. Because, you know, uh, big, big um, states are allergic to international agencies, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, huh? Mm -hmm. And especially if it's not just the government, because we have workers and employers. And in fact, I didn't t t t tell you is that in terms of the ratio, we have two government, one worker and one employer, members. It's a 211. You may ask why 211. Uh, it, it was an intense discussion, in fact, in 1919. Uh, the, the, everybody wanted 111. Huh? And the government said, at the end of the day, it will be us who will be implementing the conventions. It's our onus. We have to, you know? So that's why they, they argued for two, 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 two votes. So to answer your question, sir, uh, UK and France are doing pretty well. Uh, of, although, although there are issues, I mean, there have been challenges and, and, and complaints about, about UK. Yeah? I, can, I can come back to that, especially on the minimum wage. There were issues about discrimination, who was paid, who was not paid. And uh, ILO, as I said, we don't only deal with the non-democratic countries or the developing countries, but also there are big issues in developed countries uh, that we also uh, make sure that they improve their legis legislations for protecting labor rights. Yep. Can we have time for one yes, last please. question? Thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I would like to know how can you assure that the reports which has to be forced to an uh, organization, that they are not, let's say, aligned or you know, make time? And is there a correlation visible between the time? You mentioned some states are far behind twice uh, ten years, yeah. Or ten years behind. So, is there a correlation between supporting the report and aligning somehow the report that the results are like you you expect them? Mm. Can you can you check this somehow? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Thank you for that question. In terms of making sure the the reports are fair, I mean, it could happen in a sense if there's a Labour government in power. Right, and the workers have supported them, so the report will be okay. And if the employers say, oh, "No, no, it's not true," what they have written, in fact, they have they have uh, argued for a higher minimum wage, which is disastrous for us. Their policy is not good. They will mention that it's it's compulsory, right? So then we we may know that yeah, of course there are issues. So it's workers and government can get together, or the other vice versa. If the conservatives are there, they get together with the employers the employers' federations, huh? with the Chamber of Commerce and the government, more right-wing, uh, they outmaneuver the, 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 the workers. And then the workers say, oh, no, it's not true. These are, this is what's happening in the reality. So there is a, a mechanism where we can control those things. Right? And your second question was? Uh, the correlation between um, time yeah, and yeah. aligning. Yeah. Uh, you know, legislation takes time, no? In 10 years, nothing much will change. Even in our index, we see for the past 10 years, it's more or less the same in terms of legislation. So especially those countries which have not submitted report, and these are new member states. I mean, the last one to join ILO was Cook Islands in 2015. And they have behind uh, many reports. And Tuvalu is one of them, I think, Marshall. Tonga has not ratified any convention, zero. Mm. All the members since 2013, I think, yeah, Tonga, yeah. So my Pacific neighbors, yeah, they need assistance. And, and, and as Nicole was saying, we go and help them, in fact. We have the expertise to go and help them prepare their reports. 
We have a massive training program. Uh, we have a center in Turin in Italy, International Training Center of ILO. And they organize, I think, like 5,000 trainings a year uh, on, on various issues. And, and the training is a very, very big component of our, of, of our work. In, we provide this technical assistance. So there should not be an excuse. The problem which happens is that once we train people, especially from the small countries, they move. We have to train. It's never-ending story. It's like when you, you train two people in three years, you are done, as Daniel was saying. But then if the people move out, they get better jobs, mm -hmm. we're, we're back to square one. And that's a big challenge for small, small countries. Yeah. Let's thank Dr. Prasad. For thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the next presentation by Julian Aguon, he, he couldn't make it today, uh, but we have a recording, I think Petra will play it now, um, on the work that his um, law firm uh, does uh, with uh, helping to promote the interests and the rights of Pacific peoples. Um, so Julian, so well, <laughs> welcome to London. We are really sorry that you can't be here. and. We hope that everything will be all right on, on your end and all, all our sympathies with you. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't really not have you talk because, as, as, uh, as you know, I've heard you talk about law as an activism tool before in Wellington, and it is such a fantastic and inspiring uh, talk you gave that I think we need to share that with a wider um, European um, audience. Just starting with law as an activism tool, how have you used, what, what, what's the idea behind this talk? What is your personal experience about using law as an activism tool? I guess the best way to get at that question is just talking a little bit about what inspired me to become a lawyer in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I actually went to law school because in 2005, um, the U.S. had negotiated a bilateral agreement with the government of Japan. And this involved sort of a massive military re relocation of um, thousands of um, Marines from Okinawa to Guam. Of course, obviously, without the input from the local government of Guam, as well as the indigenous people here. Um, and so the entire, that from 2005 on, I mean, we just dealt with from 2009, they released these major draft environmental impact studies, essentially thousands of pages long, um, where basically we realized as a small, relatively powerless community that um, essentially that the U.S. Department of Defense had planned one of the sort of largest waves of militarization in recent history and a plan to house so much of it here in our small 212 square mile island, you know, and all without our input. So we, I, like I was, I really decided to go to law school because I was tired of being talked out of rooms, mostly by lawyers, you know? So I think that's, and I think that's part of the sort of like the impulse. I think that's, I think that's part of what law is, you know, in some ways it's sort of um, like in a historical erecting of very high barriers, very high walls, you know, that's meant in part at least to keep people out, at least certain people, you know? And I think that's um, the, what I was noticing was that all the sort of range of US federal environmental statutes that were being deployed, like sort of like rhetorical weapons of mass destruction against this community. And I just decided no more. You know, so like I was going to go to law school and so me and other like minded you know, progressive young people like we went to law school and we came back to the community and we've been aiming to contribute, you know, to really decisively interrupt the dynamic where the colonized people are constantly having to appeal to the colonizer to do something on our behalf. I mean, we just, you know, saw it like that. I mean, you know, and that's what we wanted. That's how I've always viewed law practice. I mean, that's how I run my firm, Blue Ocean Law. Like, we just believe that we are not in the business of using law and legal process to amass sort of like private wealth and power, but instead to, you know, distribute power. Um, so that's what we've always done. I mean, that's sort of like the um, animating principle behind the firm, actually, to try to provide maximal legal protection for very vulnerable communities in this region, in the Pacific, um, for colonized and indigenous peoples. And can you give us one or two examples? Sure. Um, so we, um, basically, we were the lead litigators in the Davis versus Guam case, which is a case that was uh, went through already, even including even at the appellate level, 
the Ninth Circuit um, Court of Appeals. So it's, it's a case that journeyed through the U.S. federal court system, but it was a case that threatens to deny the fundamental right of self-determination of the native inhabitants of Guam. So essentially the right to uh, the, deny us the remedy of decolonization, to express by way of a plebiscite our political desires regarding our future political relationship with the United States. And that's a fundamental right. And we went to court to defend that right. Um, that was just one example, and it was for our own community. But um, sort of taking a wider view in the region, we have worked with President Heine of the Republic of the Marshall Islands on a range of issues. We've helped various atolls in the Marshallese um, system um, try to diversify their legal strategies in the broader pursuit of redress. Um, I'm sure many people in the room are aware um, that the Marshall Islands, perhaps more than any other country on earth, sit squarely at the intersection of sort of unresolved nuclear legacies, like harm from nuclear testing that has not been remediated, um, and climate change. And so like the Runit Dome, for example, is, 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 is kind of like it's illustrative because it serves as the perfect example where it's the harms of the latter. So like harms associated with a changing warming climate and how they're exacerbating harms of the former, you know, the unresolved nuclear legacy. So essentially the US military raked up all of this radioactive slurry on one of the um, islands out in, in we talk in, in the Runa Dome, they call it the tomb. Um, and they raked it all together and the, didn't even line it as just a cement dome, a concrete dome out there. That's, you know, let people like, I mean, actually there was just a story last week from the LA Times about how, you know, climate change is really beating that dome up and actually there's leaking radioactive waste. And so like basically what we've been trying to do is try to just one is draw connections between climate change and unresolved nuclear issues, the, the dome being one of them, but also assisting the government in very practical, concrete ways and finding sort of like at least devising various legal strategies to try to pursue, you know, one or more types of cases, you know, against one or more types of parties on one or more theories of liability. So essentially giving the government tools to do that. We also assisted, um, we are also, we, we're a law firm, but we have five lawyers and we were all licensed in various islands. Like I myself am licensed in the Marshall Islands as well as Palau and Guam. And so like being just also locally licensed and understanding the local like legal system. Um, also we tried to devise some good laws and also helped create the National um, Nuclear Commission, which has been recently empowered to investigate all of these things and to basically still sort of pursue redress for the harms visited upon the Marshall the Marshallese people which have been unspeakable um, I would say that they're pretty long-running crimes against humanity in fact um, and of course um, just to be sorry to speak so long about this but it's not just the nuclear legacy actually that's more well known but it's also this other legacy that happened shortly after and has continued for several decades, and that's the legacy of non-consensual medical experimentation done on the Marshallese people, not only by the U.S. government, but, con but continued by sort of private, including Ivy League universities, working in you know, concert with each other and creating corporations to sort of run these sort of national medical laboratories to continue this largely non-consensual medical medical experimentation, which we all know is a fund it's a human rights violation. And so what we were doing is trying to bring all of these sort of like mechanisms, both under US domestic as well as international law, um, mechanisms and remedies to bear on that on that struggle. So that's just two examples. We do some other stuff in other islands, um, but I don't know how much you want, but yeah. Can I ask you something? Um, and just a little bit like New Zealand in comparison to, of course, Guam uh, or the Marshall Islands is a big state, yeah? but if you come from other parts like the US or I mean, from Germany, it's relatively small. And one thing what I have experienced is that you do a combination of legal mechanisms, other the legal route, and then the political, you know, media, lobbying route um what how how do you play that how do you play i'm that? smiling i'm just smiling because i completely agree i enthusiastically agree with that i mean i mean you, we all know that that's just legal process alone is not you know that's not where it's at it's about multi-prong really clearly connected legal and political strategies working sort of hand in hand 
I mean, like part of the success, I'll give you an example, the Marshall Islands, you know, took all of the world you know, the nuclear states to task. Um, the Marshall Islands sued nine nuclear states in the ICJ. I um, mean, you know, and those were like, that's the legal portion, but there was a global movement accompanied by like Nobel Peace Prize laureates, like, you know, the past winners of the prize and like Des um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and just sort of like the rallying support from really sort of luminar luminaries of the global left, but also like, all of the sort of like the nuclear zero campaign that was accompanying a beautiful website, a huge petition. I mean, it was, you know, there's, it, it just spawned so many other like efforts, smaller efforts. It's almost like it just fed so many rivers at the same time. And it's a good example of a successful use of both legal and political process. And, you know, the political campaigning part of it and just hardcore straight up like legal action. And I think, you know, and I honestly think I keep talking about the Marshall Islands, but actually on this note, it's such a good country to use as a case study because this country proves that smallness is a state of mind. This country is punching well above its weight in every arena globally, from climate change to nuclear disarmament. I mean, this country is giving the world so many reasons to smile, you know? That, that's great. So, so one issue, um, because we're looking a little bit at civil, also civil society, mm. given that these, that societies are small and everybody basically probably knows each other anyway, um, how does that work, especially if you do legal in political? I mean, yeah. there New Zealand is bigger and there is, you know, and you find the left where you find the right and you find the people and they're not necessarily intersect that much. Yeah. Whereas for, us, for you, that must be a real issue, is it? It is, it is, but actually, can I use a, another like a piece of work we do as a firm to actually illustrate the point about civil society? So basically, we our work in Melanesia actually um, mm -hmm. is really um, sort of geared at strengthening and amplifying the voice of civil society. We as a firm provide sort of legal analysis. Um, uh, we provide sort of as thorough as possible legal analysis of really pertinent and applicable international norms, such as the precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. um, the avoiding the avoidance of transboundary harm, and as well as the emerging indigenous rights regime. Um, so, like for example, the norm and right of free, prior, and informed consent. So, we're using all three of these norms as an example to really problematize the global um, discourse around this emergent extractive industry known as deep sea mining, also known as seabed mining. So, we actually work in. In, in, we work hand in. We work in partnership with various community-based organizations, civil society organizations, who are taking their own governments to task. Because part of what's happening is that many of the Pacific Island states are rushing, in part supported by the SBC, which is in turn supported by the European Union, actually, um, who funds um, the the sort of like. Uh, the SPC's sort of initiative for seabed mining. And so essentially what we noticed happening as a firm was basically a fast tracking of legal, like legislative and regulatory frameworks to essentially green light this sort of new industry without sufficient safeguards. We don't believe that the model um, frameworks that were being passed around and just sort of peddled around the different PI states were actually sufficiently protective. They weren't rights respectful. I mean, they didn't really do enough to sort of, um, give, you know, give life to those principles that we mentioned, that the, the principles I just talked about. And so we assisted governments to the extent that we could. But, but more importantly, we actually realized that our true allies and partners were these civil society groups, because they were already so engaged in the issue. They were so informed about things. They just needed certain things that they didn't have because they just happened not to be lawyers. So like the legal analysis, really sort of in-depth legal analysis of the norms assisted civil society groups with their missions and their work already which was quite efflorescent i mean some of these community-based organizations um their work is just really um just really superb you know and so especially around the seabed mining work and so we were so happy to assist and even in a limited capacity so basically also what you're telling us is there is in there is might be a slight subject meta specialization but you have to be you know the Heart, uh, I want to work, use the word, you know, lawyer when you go to court, but on the other hand, you have to be flexible and slightly politically minded and more probably in a maybe I wouldn't say mediation role when you work with civil society groups and in a political. So you, you have to have a really broad range of interpersonal 
skills to do what you're doing. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know if there's a better way to say that, but that's pretty accurate, actually. You just need sort of a, a toolkit with just several tools in it. Um, but I think part of it is just a better attitude. I think part of, you know, us lawyers, people in this profession, for some reason, we're not deep listeners. You know, and I think part of the work we do, we try to do this, you know, as a team, is that we try to really attend to the clearly articulated needs and desires of the community. So taking your cue from community is so important, especially in these islands, you know, like if you're in a, like working with like a country like Papua New Guinea with such range, I mean, so much like staggering levels of diversity. I mean, like cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, every kind of diversity. I mean, like, you know, the needs of say a community along the coast of the new Ireland province whose sort of traditional and customary practices include the ancient practice, spiritual practice of shark calling, they clearly have a narrative, a story to tell about the kinds of very unique particular harms being you know, visited upon them by this emerging extractive industry because they're disturbing the sharks who are then in turn not, basically they're sort of, it's a, they're unable to transmit these practices to the younger generation. And so we've talked to people and I know that we've worked with community-based organizations who work directly with the community members and who basically have reported feeling high levels of distress, you know, about sort of the, the worry about this sort of the end of the really an ancient spiritual practice and a rite of passage for young men in certain villages. So these are really site-based, concerns you know so like listening to the community and understanding them like it's one thing to talk about you know the right of free prior informed consent in some generic abstract sort of hyper generalized way and it's an entirely a different thing to sort of really work on its sort of logical application in particular contexts on the ground you know i mean like when i've spoken with various groups of international lawyers it's those it's particular kinds of stories like the shark calling stories from the New Ireland province that really resonated with people and including with international attorneys because they were like, this is the kind of sort of story, the kind of narrative that we need to frame our contestation of this extractive industry around. Yeah. F fantastic. Um, really fascinating and it's a real shame that you won't be here and we can't with you. Oh, I wish I was. You know, in your, even over dinner about all your experiences and your enthusiasm, you know, I think that's definitely you know, exuding daddy through, through the uh, video camera, basically, through the recording. Um, any, anything you would like to share with the audience here, some, something you would kind of give them to take away? That's, that's a big question, actually. Sorry. Um, no, I mean, because I think about it all the time, you know, we always have to sort of be willing to revisit sort of the possibility of doing things wrong. I mean, like, like if we're just being insufficient or inadequate in the work that we do, you know, like, so we have like to, have to constantly check that. Um, I think one of the things is sort of just being really heeding this, this idea of staying close staying in really close conversation with communities that you know that we are intending to serve because if you know we we lose track of what you know what the community actually wants and often i mean we have found this in our own work often communities do know precisely what they want you know it's just like outside so-called helpers are sort of like not really good listeners so we've seen that happen with other less sort of legal like you know outfits who sort of like go around and they don't actually sort of actively and deeply listen to the communities that they're purporting to serve so that's one of the other things and the other thing is you know just i think just to share one thing just that's i it, to the extent that it's more hopeful or positive it's just really the reason why we do we are so excited about the work we do as a firm it's just because the region that we serve in particular i mean there's such range in this community, you know, like, I mean, in this region, in, the, in Oceania, in the Pacific region. And so we as a firm, we work throughout Oceania. And we are so, the work is so meaningful because basically we are constantly engaged in a robust conversation with people who have different imaginations. 
people who basically have inherited worldviews that are completely unlike the dominating one, you know? So the neoliberal sort of worldview that is everywhere bringing this planet to its knees, you know? So like, like they offer humanity part of the answer, at least part of the answer about how to get us all out of the mess that we're in. And I think that's something that the Indian writer Arundhati Roy said once that, I, that always resonated with me. Personally, she was like, the imagination that got us into this mess will not be, cannot be, the imagination to get us out of it. And I think that's why we seek so passionately to sort of provide maximal legal protection for the indigenous peoples of this particular region, because we believe they do have part of that answer. And that's why it's, you know, a great joy to, to do the work. We definitely could, could see that. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you as well. That, that, was, that was fascinating. We wish that at one point we, you would join us in London on a later stage. Yeah, I really hope maybe if you can invite me next time, I, it, will, it will happen. Yeah. Yeah, oh, def, def, definitely. Um, and, all, and all the best. Thank you so much, Petra, and all the best to everyone. Thank you. Right, I won't keep you from the coffee any longer, but on your way there, please um, join me in thanking our speakers.